えー、私はあの司会させていただきます、えー、と京都大学理学部物理教室の前野といいますよろしくお願いします、えー、今日はあのアンソニー・レゲット教授に東大特別講義ということで、えー、午前中はノーベル物理学賞にあの、まあ、講演に関する講演をしていただきました午後は、えー「時間の矢」というタイトルで、えー、お話しいただきますそれで、えー、簡単にですねあのレゲットさんのあのまあ、兄弟物理の伝統に従ってあえてレゲット先生じゃなくてレゲットさんと呼ばせていただきます、えー、レゲットさんの,あのご経歴を紹介させていただきます、えー、特にあの京都大学の物理学教室ともあの関わりをあの学校しておられます、えー、レゲットさんは、えー、ロンドンの近郊で1938年に生まれになりました、えー、そして、えーまあ、学生の方も多いと思いますが、北総の大学に、まあ、今でいうソビ級で入学されまして、えー、当時その、一番その学問としてハイクラスであるというような認識があったそうなんですけど、まあ、クラシック古典です、えー、ラテンのギリシャ語、えー、に基づいて、まあえー、哲学研究、えー、それであの学部の学位を取られました。でしかしあの、卒業する前直前になって、物理学を、第二の専門と専攻として、学校の第二ディプロマとして専攻されまして、両方のクラシック古典と物理学とで卒業されました。そしてその後、あのオックスフォード大学の大学院にそのまま進まれまして、えー、指導教員はあの教授はエルハールという教授のもとで、博士論文のタイトルはヘリウム、潮流のヘリウム4におけるトモ。のあの研究そしてもう一つのトピックとしては、えー、上流動のヘリウム3の中にほんのわずかヘリウム3をヘリウム4を入れた、えー、そういう経緯の,あの性質について研究されました、えー、そして発症を取られて1964年5年の頃は、えー、イリノイ大学アーバナ・シャンペーンで、えー、UIUC といいますかアメリカのイリノイ大学でポストドクター博士研究員の時を取られましたそして1965年の秋から1年間、えー、京都大学に、えー、物理教室の、えー、京大理学物理の松原武雄教授のグループで、えー、常藤教授が若い頃にそれは1965年ですから、えー、東京オリンピックの隠れ年です。でまあ、建築ラッシュで物理教室もちょうどその時に南館というのを建設しているところだと建設があったと今は物理教室で1年間おられましたそしてその後六67年からはサセックス大学そして83年からはイリノイ大学に戻りましてイリノイ大学の教授として30年間おられましたでレゲンさんはあの超流動超伝導の研究で非常に著名ですけれどもえー、そしてもう一つ非常に著名なのはあのー、マクロな系での特に散逸がある系での量子力学量子的な振る舞いというそういう物理学の分野を先導する研究をされましたで特にあの超伝導のジョゼフソン接合であるとかそういうあの凝縮系の系を使って量子力学の基礎を検証するとそういうあの研究の理論研究をしておられました、えー、そして、えー、非小質ですねガラスガラスグラスというまあ、非常質体の低温での振る舞いであるとか、僕最近はボーザインシュタイン凝縮ですね、冷却気体のボーザインシュタイン凝縮の研究でも、えー、非常に著名な成果を上げておられます。で、えー、この3年間はですね、あの学新、日本学術振興会の、えー、招きで、東京大学で1年間に1ヶ月滞在して集中講義をされております。で今年で3年目になると思うんですけれども、えー、ですからこの後あの東京大学の行かれて、あの講義が、ここで両親計算という講義を、大学院生の講義をされます。で、えー、今回はあの私の方があのあのグループリーダーさせていただきます、えー、進学術領域研究トポロジカル量子現象というプロジェクトがあるんですが、あのそのあの外国人アドバイザーの一人になっていただいておりまして、この三年間ですね。で、まあそういう経緯もありまして、京都にも立ち寄りいただいて、今回のあの特別講演と。講義をしていただくということになりました。で、あのこの午後の講演に対しては、関してはあの低温物理学、あの低温物理科学、低温物質科学研究センターと
LPM センターなあの協賛をいただいてあの実現しましたのでお礼申し上げます。ということであのではあの講義を始めたいと思います。えっと席の方がまだそちらに少しあります。立っておられる方そこに席がありますのでどうぞ。座ってくださいあとのまた来られる、遅れて来られる方のために、なるべく後ろの方は、えー、前に席がありますので、ぜひお願いします。はい、それでは、Please welcome Professor b e g e t b e g e t さん、よろしくお願いします。So something wrong, right? <laughs> okay, so you, we can all tell、um, when the arrow of time, as it were, is reversed. So why should this arrow of time, or、um, why should it be a problem? 
think about the elementary rules of physics. Uh, can we go to the first uh, actual slide now? So I, so I just... Uh, so we want the first is, uh, text slide. Okay, good, fine. Good. The problem is that with one very small exception, which I will mention briefly, the microscopic laws of physics, that is, the laws of physics, as we know them, at the level of atoms and molecules and so forth, don't seem to make any distinction between the forward and backward direction of time. Let's first think about Newton's laws. Now, I'm sure you're mostly familiar with Newton's three laws. Newton's first law um, says that Everybody remains at rest or in uniform motion so long as no external force acts on it. Well, there's no reference there to whether time is flowing forward or backward. Newton's third law says that every action is accompanied by an equal and opposite reaction. Again, no mention of the direction of time there. So if there is any reference to the direction, to direction of time, it has to be in Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that mass is force, uh, sorry, force is mass times acceleration. Uh, the force, for example, that might be due to gravity, for example, the gravity of the Earth. And fairly obviously, there's no reference to the direction of time there. Again, mass, fairly no, no uh, reference. So if there is any reference to the direction of time, it has to be in the concept of acceleration. Now, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. Suppose time is run backwards, then velocity is reversed. For example, suppose that I'm standing on the, uh, against the wall of a merry-go-round. And suppose that the uh, merry-go-round is rotating clockwise, then the velocity is in this direction. Now, I will feel, under those circumstances, I will feel an acceleration towards the centre of the, uh, of the merry-go-round. I know that because there will be a force pressing against my back. And perhaps some of you have uh, perhaps been to this machine in a, a fun fair where they uh, press you against the wall of a rotating cylinder and then drop the floor away, and you're stuck against the wall, and you continue to rotate. Okay? So definitely the acceleration, the force you're experiencing, and therefore the acceleration you're experiencing, is towards the centre. Now suppose that we run the, the merry-go-round backwards. Now the velocity is reversed. However, you will still feel the same force on your back pressing you towards the centre. So the acceleration is the same, despite the fact that the velocity has been reversed. So, uh, in other words, Newton's three laws, all of them, would work just as well backwards as forwards. They would not enable you to say which way round time is firm. Well, you say, OK, that's fine, but that is just mechanics. What about electromagnetism? For example, Suppose I have a magnetic field in the vertical direction. And imagine I have a charged particle, such as an electron, which is moving in this field. Then the electron will perhaps circulate anticlockwise around the field. So you say to yourself, fine, now if I move the if I show the movie backwards, the electron will be moving this way. And so I will know the difference. No? There's a cat. Where did the magnetic field come from? The magnetic field was produced by currents in certain uh, coils in a, in a, a magnet. Um, the, uh, the currents are electrons flowing. So if I reverse the direction of time, I must reverse the direction of the current, the magnetic field is no longer up but down. Right? 
And so do EED. The electron will circulate clockwise, but if so it should, you will not be able to tell, tell the difference. Uh, some of you might, um, might have met quantum mechanics. And at first sight, at least, in quantum mechanics, it does look as if there's some reference to the direction of time. Because the way that textbook problems are normally formulated is that they say, okay, they give you the quantum mechanical state, the wave function, at some initial time. And then they uh, integrate Schrodinger's equation forward in time, and at the end of a certain period, they make a measurement and read off the results. So at first sight, it looks as if the direction of time is quite important. But that's not really the case. It's a very famous paper by Aharonov, Bergman, and Lebowitz, nearly 50 years ago now, where they actually um, show that it's perfectly possible to formulate uh, quantum mechanics in a way which is completely symmetric with respect to the direction of time. And then, by making certain assumptions, you can get the usual quantum mechanics or sort of time reverse version. But the basic formulation is time symmetric. So, so most of the laws of physics at the microscopic level don't seem to know the difference between the forward and backward direction of time. Now. There is one exception. There is one kind of collision which we nowadays can produce in high energy accelerators. And it does look as if that particular kind of collision does know the difference between the forward and backward directions. In fact, so that if you were to show a movie of the collision process, in principle, you could know whether it was being shown backwards or forwards. However, that's, only, that's a matter of relatively recent discovery. Um, in fact, it's only a few months ago that it was actually um, verified uh, with certainty experimentally. Um, so it's certainly a very, in some sense, not at all an everyday phenomenon. Most people, including me, believe that that peculiar asymmetry in high energy physics is not really relevant to the kind of problem I'm going to be talking about today. It's conceivable we could be wrong, but uh, right now uh, that certainly seems the, uh, the majority opinion, and I will assume that. So, um, so for the rest of this lecture, I will ignore that slight complication. Okay. Um, so now connected with this, um, uh, this question of the... Um, symmetry of the laws of physics, and the second question, again, related but not quite the same. Um, uh, oh, okay, I think we, we, skip, we skip a couple of uh, um, movies, perhaps, here, and go on to the next um, text slide. So, can I do that? <coughs> can uh, yeah, fine, good. Um, the question is, is there any basis in microscopic physics for the idea that the past causes the future rather than vice versa? Well, imagine that we consider a simple textbook um, uh, problem here. Uh, here, for example, is a cannon, which is going to fire a cannon. And the way that the problem is usually formulated in mechanics textbooks is that uh, the book gives you the initial position and velocity of the cannonball. And then it invites you to calculate the subsequent trajectory of the cannonball. Um, so that, for example, it will ask you to calculate the intermediate position and velocity, and perhaps the final position and velocity. So, in other words, if we know the initial position and velocity, we can determine the exact trajectory determine the whole behavior of the cannonball in the future. So that um, tends to suggest that, in some sense, these initial conditions cause the subsequent motion. And this is the basis of a very famous thought experiment due to the French um, mathematician and physicist Pierre Simon Laplace 
in the early 19th century. Laplace said to himself, let's consider a demon whose facilities, his faculties, are so acute that at a particular time he can determine the positions and velocities of every particle in the universe. And moreover, let's suppose that this demon knows all the forces acting. Then the demon would be able to uh, exactly foretell the whole state of the universe for the, for the, the complete future. You know, the whole future of the universe. And for many people, that thought experiment has seemed a strong <coughs> argument against the idea of free will. I thought I'd just raise my arm voluntarily. But if you really take Laplace seriously, then a demon who knew the positions and velocities of every atom in the universe, including those in my brain, um, ten minutes ago, could have foretold exactly that I was going to raise my arm at this time. And therefore my uh, impression of possessing free will is an illusion. <coughs> well, there are all sorts of things one can say about that argument. But here's one thing, I think, which one ought to say. Going back to this original textbook, um, Thought Experiment, Newton's second law is second order in time. So technically that means that any two independent pieces of information will suffice to completely determine the solution. So for example, if I know the final position and the final velocity of the cannonball, then I can work backwards in time and determine its complete trajectory, including the initial position and velocity. Again, if I know the intermediate position and velocity, I can work both forwards and backwards and determine the whole trajectory. Um, and so, in, uh, at least within the context of Newtonian mechanics and the rest of microscopic physics, there really is no basis for the idea that it's the past which is causing the future and not vice versa. They come in in exactly the same footing. Well, okay. Um, so, so uh, this puzzled a lot of people, uh, particularly in the early 19th century. And uh, eventually, a very brilliant group of scientists, physicists, and engineers, mostly French, came up in the early 19th century with a, uh, a kind of solution to this problem, or at least a different approach to this problem. And it's based essentially not on considering single particles um, and their, their behavior according to Newton's laws, but large collections of particles, let us say atoms. So, how what a molecule? Let's imagine, for example, we have a, a large number of molecules which are confined in one half of a box. The box is separated into two by a partition, which, however, can be withdrawn. Well, initially we confined the molecules on this side, and of course, so long as the partition remains in place, they will stay there. However, let's suppose that sometime we pull away the partition. Then, we all know, and sometimes almost common sense by now, that the molecules will expand to fill the whole box. And now, we can wait as long as we like, but as long as we don't do anything drastic uh, to the system, uh, there is no possibility the atoms will all spontaneously reverse and occupy this state. Why? Well, intuitively you say, look, um, there's a lot more ways the atoms can dispose themselves here than here, so why should they voluntarily go back to this very small, very small number of states they have here? And now I'm going to illustrate this point with an example which I can I can use freely um, in the United States when I give this lecture. I'm not entirely sure that I can use it freely in Japan because uh, I'm not sure that everyone will have had the relevant experience as they, as they all have in the United States. But anyway, this, uh, this analogy is um, related to parking. Uh, if you have, in fact, taken a, a driving lesson, you will, I think, understand this very well. Um, 
uh, suppose you are taking your first driving lesson. And the instructor takes you to the school car, which is parked by the sidewalk, and he instructs you to drive it out into the road. So you have no particular difficulty doing that, generally speaking. But now at the end of the hour, he brings you back to the same point, and he instructs you to park the car above the sidewalk. Here. You all know that that is much, much more difficult. Right? Well, why is it more difficult? Well, <laughs> fairly obviously, uh, because um, in some sense, here, you will, your, the state you're trying to attain is a very large time of space. In other words, there are many possibilities as to where you could actually emerge into the road. Here, on the other hand, you have to get back into a single state, or at least a small set of states, along with you. So, in some sense, it's very easy to go from a small initial state, uh, space to a large final space, and vice versa. Now, in physics, we try to formalize this idea by introducing a quantitative measure of the, uh, the number of states, or, uh, as we sometimes say, the degree of disorder. Now, at first sight, one could just define the disorder as the number of available states, or the amount of available space. But for technical reasons, we prefer not to do that. We prefer to define the degree of disorder as proportional to the logarithm of the number of, of, of states. As I say, the, the reasons for that are technical, and I won't try to go into them. And in physics, we postulate a quantity called entropy, which is usually denoted S, um, and that is supposed to be, in some sense, a measure of disorder. And more quantitatively, we say that the, um, the entropy, S, is a particular constant, nowadays called Boltzmann's constant, times the log, logarithm of the number of available states. Uh, and this is usually called uh, um, Boltzmann's uh, equation, related to his name. Um, and then the famous law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics, tells us entropy always increases with time, with time. And at first sight, that seems very natural, because after all, uh, we all know that it's much easier to go from uh, for a, a, a state uh, with a small number of states, that is, with low disorder, into a state of higher disorder. And if any of you are parents and have ever left your small child alone to play in a room which is filled with uh, various objects, uh, you will readily appreciate that disorder does tend to increase in time. Um, so at first sight, this is a very common sense explanation of the origin of time and asymmetry. It is the, the, the forward direction in time is simply the direction in which disorder increases. And you think, wait a moment, that's not quite so simple. Unfortunately, many of the many standard textbooks basically leave it at this point and give you the, the idea that they explain the direction of time. It's not standard. Let's go on to the next slide. Imagine the following thought experiment. I have here a machine which is designed to shuffle uh, a deck of cards. Okay. Uh, you all know what, uh, what uh, that involves. Um, and uh, this uh, machine is enclosed in a locked room, um, and uh, every time it shuffles the cards, it displays the results on a table here. And we have a camera. Um, well, one of the functions of the camera is to make sure that no super Houdini sneaks into the room and disturbs the experiment. But the other fun uh, function of the camera is simply to record the, uh, the, the uh, different arrangements of the deck of cards. So this machine will be shuffling the cards. Every time it's done, it's done one shuffling process, the camera will take a photograph of it and record it, and go on and do the next shuffling process, and so forth. Now imagine that we've set this machine in motion, and it's shuffling away, and we go off to lunch. And we come back from lunch and inspect the picture which the camera is currently showing. And to our great surprise, it shows something like this. Um, Ace, King, Queen, Jack of Spades, dot, dot, dot. Perfectly ordered set of cards. What would we conclude? 
well, obviously, the most obvious conclusion is that indeed some kind of super Houdini has slunk into the room and managed to evade the camera and prepared the cards in this way. That's the obvious common sense assumption. Right? But suppose that somehow we manage to convince ourselves that that's not right. Uh, then what can we conclude? Well, the most obvious thing we conclude is that as, as the shuffling process proceeds in time, the deck of cards will get steadily more disordered, as it's doing in this uh, figure here. Right? So, so indeed, disorder will increase in time. Now we think, wait a moment. What happened, what happened earlier? Well, after all, the inverse of a shuffling process is itself a shuffling process. So what that means is that if we were given that at, at 12 o'clock, say, the cards were perfectly ordered, then we know for sure that at 11.55 they were more disordered and will get further disordered as we go back into the past. In other words, in this case, the disorder will be decreasing in time. So why don't we usually say that? Well, in the first sight, it's uh, because we all know, as a matter of common experience, that as human beings, we can physically prepare, prepare a definite arrangement, I'll say, and then let nature take its course. What we don't seem to be able to do is what you might call retro pair. That is to set a final condition here and watch what happens as we go backwards in time from that. And so, um, so at first sight, that would seem to connect the asymmetry of time with what we, we as human beings can or cannot do. But this already is getting, as you see, a somewhat circular argument. And worse, it can't, in any case, it can't be the whole truth, because there are many processes in which no human being is involved, where we can still recognize the error of time. Let's take a look on those. Suppose, for example, we have a rock which is perched unstably at the top of a cliff. After a time, erosion takes effect. The rock detaches itself from the cliff, rolls down the cliff face, falls into a lake at the bottom, and waves radiate outwards to infinity. Um, and eventually, the rock will settle on the bottom of the pool. Now, suppose that we were, sh we were shown a movie in which the rock starts at the bottom of the pool, spontaneously lifts itself to the surface, the waves come flowing in from infinity, the rock um, rolls back up the cliff and reattaches itself at the top. Of course, we would know that this is shown the wrong way round, despite the fact that no human being is involved in this picture. So it can't be quite that simple. At this point, let's, um, just, uh, uh, let's just try to review the various possible manifestations of the arrow of time as we know them in everyday life and in physics and cosmology. Oh, um, sorry, before I, no, before I do that, I'm sorry, there's one, one uh, important point I want uh, to tell you about. This is not a new problem. Um, people have been worried about this problem ever since the middle of the 19th century, perhaps even earlier. And one of the problem, people who worried most um, intensely about it was indeed Ludwig Boltzmann. Now here is his, um, his tombstone in the Central Friedhof in Vienna, in Austria. And ironically, above um, his, uh, his bust is inscribed the equation S equals K log W, which I showed you earlier. The reason it's ironical is that apparently, historically, there was no evidence that Boltzmann ever wrote that equation down. Uh, even though it is very closely associated with his ideas, but he didn't actually write it down. But nevertheless, we call it Boltzmann's equation. Anyway, I say Boltzmann thought very, very hard about this problem, and he actually came up with a very, very clever solution, which amazingly anticipates um, ideas from nearly 200 years later. And here's how, roughly how Boltzmann's um, solution goes. Boltzmann said, well, look, uh, we know that on average, the state of the universe all will, have, will always tend to the state of maximum disorder. So for most of its time, you have to remember, incidentally, that in Boltzmann's day, 
Um, people didn't know about the Big Bang. They thought that the universe was more or less time independent and static. Um, so, uh, so, on the whole, on average, the universe will be in the state of maximum disorder, that is, maximum entropy. But occasionally, but, but Wilfer also, having invented basically much of the of what we now call statistical mechanics, Wilfer also realised that there was a small but non-zero probability that a small region of the universe would, uh, from time to time, fluctuate away from the state of maximum disorder into a state of somewhat higher order, that is, lower entropy. So imagine that a small part of the, um, of the universe in which we, we happen to be sitting has fluctuated away from uh, this state of maximum disorder. Well, of course, eventually it's got to go back to, to the maximum disorder. But now suppose that we are actually living at this, this point on the curve. Then uh, we will see uh, disorder increasing in this direction. And therefore, that will be the direction of the future as we perceive it. If, on the contrary, we had been living on this part of the curve here, then uh, we would see disorder increasing in this direction, and we would have said this is the direction of the future. Well, <coughs> so far, so good. But now, then, of course, the question um, arises, why should we be sitting on this part of the curve at all? After all, the vast majority of the universe at all times is in this state of maximum disorder. So how come that we're actually sitting on this very improbable fluctuation? And then Boltzmann gave to, uh, to, to this a very remarkable answer. He said it in effect, well, um, if we were sitting on this part of the curve where disorder is a maximum, then the conditions for uh, chemistry and biology and so forth, as we know them, would not be there. So in other words, uh, there would be no question of human beings being produced. We would not be there to ask the question. So, so the, uh, the reason, as it were, that we are uh, living in this particular improbable part of the universe is that if we were not, we would simply not be here to, to uh, ask the question in the first place. And this is remarkable because it's an anticipation of a rather interesting principle which um, is quite widely discussed in physics nowadays in a slightly different context, namely the so-called anthropic principle. Um, in, um, in current, according to our current ideas of high energy physics and cosmology, um, there are a number of fundamental constants, uh, dimensionless constants, um, which we have to include in the theory, but for which we have no particular explanation. A typical example would be the ratio of the mass of the electron to the mass of the proton, about 1 to, to 1,800. Now, that number seems very firm, very fixed. Um, right now, we don't know why it has that value. Uh, perhaps some future theory will find a good reason why it has that value, but right now we don't know why. And so a rather popular point of view among um, some high energy physicists and cosmologists is that um, is to make the observation that if that mass ratio were just different by a tiny amount from what it actually is, if it were different by, say, 0.1% for its actual value, then in fact it turns out that the structure of atoms would be quite different from what it currently is. Uh, the certain molecules could not form. Chemistry, as we know it, and biology could not get up to ground. And therefore, again, we would not be able to ask this question. Um, so, uh, uh, so, as I say, this is sometimes called the anthropic principle. Anthropos is the, the Greek word for man, uh, man mankind. Um, and people argue furiously about whether that is a real explanation or not. But in any case, it's very interesting. The Boltzmann anticipated this by nearly 200 years. Now, why don't people nowadays tend to take Boltzmann's um, solution too seriously? Well, um, the problem is that Boltzmann did not have um, space stations and he didn't have uh, space telescopes or satellites. Um, and therefore, the part of the universe which he could actually see was very tiny from a modern point of view. Nowadays, we can see out to billions of light years in all directions in the universe, and it doesn't look as if our part of the universe is in any way special or a problem. In fact, we look, it looks as if our, 
from a cosmic point of view, our immediate neighbourhood is very boring and very um, similar to many other neighbourhoods. So the idea that we are part of a very special fluctuation doesn't really seem very cool. And if we would, if it, does, if it were to work, we'd have to be part of a really, really enormous fluctuation. And most people don't really like that idea. Okay, let me go on to. Um, uh, at uh, this point, to discuss the various um, manifestations of the arrow of time, as we know them, in, in everyday life and in uh, physics and cosmology. So I've excluded here that what I call, what's usually called the CP violating arrow, that's the very special one that I talked about earlier. So let's forget about that. <coughs> what kinds of, what manifestations of the arrow of time do we know? Well, the first obvious one is the psychological one which we mentioned. We can remember the past and affect the future, not vice versa. Uh, again, there's a biological error. Uh, generally speaking, plants or animals tend to start small, they grow bigger, and eventually, in, some, in one way or another, they wither away and die. Uh, there's the electromagnetic error of time. Um, now, okay, at this point, perhaps we could just have the last pair of movies, the last two. Now, the laws of electromagnetism. Yes, yes, please. Okay, now this is a. Uh, this is actually not uh, electromagnetic radiation. This is a photo of two sticks oscillating in a pond. But it's the same principle. Okay, so the, the, the radiation is waves are going out, right? However, the laws of physics are completely um, invariant under time reversal. In other words, the time reversal this should be equally valid. Could you do the next one? Yeah, you see, that's an equally valid solution of the equation of motion. And, and yet, it doesn't seem to happen. And in particular, in the case of light, it doesn't seem to happen. Whether we're talking... Okay, okay thank you. Okay, we'll go back to the um, slide now. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, not only... Uh, I think it's a non-trivial fact. Not only... Man-made objects like light bulbs, but also natural objects like stars, seem to always be emitting radiation, not absorbing it. Again, there's the thermodynamic error, which we've already met, the idea that disorder or entropy increases with time. And finally, there's the so-called cosmological error, which, as we'll see, is a little different. Um, that, what that means is that, at least as, as far as we know right now, the universe seems to be expanding rather than contracting. So that, again, is a, is a, a, a manifestation of the error of time. So now we can ask the question, well, is there any obvious relation between these? Can some of them be regarded as consequences of others? Well, let's take first the relationship between the psychological and the biological error. <coughs> I don't think there's anything logically absurd about the idea that I might uh, be able to remember the time when I was leaning on a stick and my hair was even whiter than it is now, um, and affect the time when I am small, this size, and, and, and scoring in my mother's arms. Nothing logically absurd about that idea. However, for the simple, most people I think would guess there are very good um, bio, neuropsychological and biological reasons why that's not likely to be the case in the reality. So, in other words, there does seem, it does seem rather natural psychological error could be regarded as a consequence of the biological error. Um, what about uh, the electromagnetic this relation here? Well, how do uh, plants, and to some extent animals, grow? Plants certainly grow by absorbing incoming sunlight and converting it into chemical energy. Now, if the sun were sucking in radiation rather than radiating it, obviously this wouldn't work. So again, this is rather natural connection between the electromagnetic and biological errors. This one here, again, um, I think it's very plausible to try to regard the electromagnetic arrow as a consequence or a special case of the thermodynamic arrow. After all, in some sense, when the radiation is contained within the star, the number of available states is much less than when it's spread out to infinity, just as for the other gas in the box. So, so again, it seems that we could regard the electromagnetic arrow as a special case of the thermodynamic arrow. Finally, what about this relation here? Now, this is the really tough one. Um, and um, so let's just go over to the next slide. <coughs> so, yeah, hopefully, oh, sorry, yeah, 
So the question is, can cosmology explain thermodynamics? That is, is the thermodynamic error of time a consequence of the cosmological error? Now, at this point, I have to admit freely that I am by no means an expert in this area. Um, however, I'm not too embarrassed to be saying a few words about it, simply because the people who really are world experts in this area, area the kind of names that you're all familiar with in popular books and so forth, they disagree furiously among themselves about this issue. So I'm not uh, particularly uh, hesitant to weigh in. There's a very standard model of the, the universe called the Friedman Robertson Walker, or FRO model. And that model contains a, an important parameter, which is the mass density of the universe, the overall mass density expressed in particular, peculiar, particular units which make it dimensionless. Um, and that's usually called capital omega. However, independently of this capital omega, all, so all standard scenarios agree about the past. That is, they all um, predict that, or the retrodict, that as you go back in time, uh, you, the universe appears to be much uh, more dense and much hotter. And if you go back far enough, you always come to a, uh, a particular point, which is usually called the hot big bang. Um, formally, at that point, you find the universe has infinite temperature and infinite density. But I think probably a more appropriate way of putting it is that it's a point at which the laws of physics, as we currently know them, seem to break down. So anyway, everyone... All versions agree on that. Um, so that raises the crucial question. Is there any a priori why the disorder should be, have, been, have been low when the universe was very dense? In other words, why is disorder low at the small end? Is there any good a priori reason why that should be so? Now, it's certainly true experimentally. If we look at the cosmic background black body radiation, we can try to estimate the initial um, entropy of the universe. And it turns out that it's orders of magnitude lower than you would expect from, as it were, a random picture. In other words, in its very early days, it does seem that the universe was very, very highly ordered. Um, the question is why? Is there any a priori reason? Well, as I say, the, the big names in the field disagree furiously about that. Uh, if you read some of the popular books which claim that it's uh, in some sense uh, almost natural, almost trivial, that it's disorder is no, at the small end, I would recommend you to read a rather good book by uh, the Australian philosopher of science, Hugh Price, called something like A Times Arrow and Archimedes Point, where he takes on head on these arguments and I think effectively demolishes them. Um, anyway, so I say it is very controversial. But putting that aside for a moment, what about the possible future of the universe? Well, we have three possibilities here. If this uh, important parameter omega is smaller than one, then at least until recently it was thought that the universe would go on expanding more or less smoothly forever. Um, if the omega is equal to one, then you might think that's very improbable, but there are some reasons for moving it might be. Um, then uh, the expansion will grab that long, um, and uh, eventually, essentially, the universe will reach a steady finite size. Finally, I'm sorry, there's a typo here. If omega is greater than 1, then the universe will expand to a maximum size and eventually contract again, becoming, uh, uh, becoming much more dense and much hotter, and eventually will disappear into what is sometimes called the hot heat crunch. Now, that raises a very interesting question. Um, suppose that, in fact, the universe is, is closed. It probably isn't, in fact, but uh, let's just it's not absurd to assume it might be. Um, in that case, it's going to expand to its maximum size um, and eventually contract again into the big crunch. Interesting question is, in this region here, we know it's getting smaller and we don't know it's getting hotter, but is the disorder increasing or decreasing? Furthermore, if human beings were still somehow alive in this, in, in this phase of the universe, which way would they see the future? They see it towards the big crunch or away from it. Again, it uh, rather surprisingly, it turns out that people can't agree about this rather, uh, uh, rather fundamental uh, question. And again, I think this is where Hugh Price's work is very important, 
he basically makes the point that anything you say about the hot big bang, you have to say about the hot big crunch. And therefore, if it was natural that disorder is low here, it must also be natural that disorder is low here. And this you really can't get away from. And I think that's a good argument. So if that were right, of course, then what would happen is that disorder would be decreasing down here, and presumably any human beings alive would see the future in this direction. But as I say, that's still, that's still on the argument. Well, um, as, so as I said, we really have a big question mark here. Um, we don't really, I think, understand the analysis. I certainly don't, but I think it's fair to say it's not very understood. So let's put that aside for a moment. Let's just... Um, uh, let's just assume that we somehow have found a reasonable explanation of the thermodynamic arrow of time in terms of the cosmological arrow. That still raises the question, could the arrow of time reverse itself locally and temporally? Now here I'm getting onto some really wild, quite wild speculation, which are uh, difficult to define, as you'll see. But think of the following analogy. Imagine a piece of iron. Now, as you know, and perhaps some of you might have heard my talk this morning, the, um, the um, electrons in iron are, can be thought of as like small magnets. And above the Curie temperature, that is in the so-called paramagnetic phase of high temperatures, the, these, um, these magnets are pointed in random directions. So there's no net magnetization. Below the Curie temperature, however, there's a very strong tendency for these magnets to point parallel. And so, in the uh, so-called ferromagnetic phase, uh, you'll find that almost always the spins are pointing in a particular direction. Let us say, along the direction of the external magnetic field. And yet, the basic principles of, of statistical mechanics tell us that every now and then, there is a non-zero probability that a small piece of, of the iron will fluctuate away from that. In other words, the spins in that region will spontaneously reverse themselves and point in the opposite direction to, to the average. As I say, these events are rare, but nevertheless they, they, they do happen with non-zero probability. Now, could there be something vaguely similar that happens with respect to the arrow of time? In other words, despite the fact that overall the, third, the second law of thermodynamics works, and time is, is flowing steadily from past to future in some intuitive sense, Nevertheless, there are small regions of space which for, you know, over which, you know, for small intervals of time, this process is reversed. In other words, that in some sense, within these regions, we could say, yes, indeed, the future is causing the present, and the present is causing the past. Completely contrary to our normal ideas. Now, as I say, it's a very wild speculation, and what's worse from a, from the point of view of a professional physicist <laughs> is, that, is that it's almost impossible to quantify. Um, now, you see, this, I think, brings out a very general point. The really, really slippery questions in physics are not the questions where one has a well-defined question and, and, and uh, merely has to try to find the answer to that question. Those are the easy cases. The really difficult issues in physics are the ones where you don't know what question you would be asked in the first place. These are really slippery questions, and I think this kind of, of speculation about the arrow of time and things in that category is extremely difficult to, 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 to formulate sufficiently precisely that one might perhaps try to do some experiments to see the rules. But so one can raise the question, why on um, earth should anyone ever contemplate such a crazy idea that, that over small local regions the arrow of time could reverse and the future could affect the present? Well, there are some, some reasons which are not so bad, actually. And one of them has to do with a very famous series of experiments which have been conducted over the last 40 years or so. Uh, now, for those who happen to know about it, let me just mention these are the so-called EPR Bell experiments. And they refer to uh, the following situation. We have an atomic source, which will, uh, a set of atoms, which are excited and can decay, emitting pairs of particles, in this case photons. These, these photons are emitted back to back. And now you do the following. You arrange that each photon at this end goes into a switch which is randomly activated and uh, can switch the, this photon into one of the two measuring devices. Each of these two devices will ask the photon a yes or no question and the photon will be forced to give an answer. So, for example, 
measurement, uh, uh, measurement instrument A might ask the question, float on the question, are you polarized vertically? Yes, or horizontally? No. Right. On the other hand, uh, measuring apparatus B might ask the photon a different question. It might ask the photon, are you polarized in this 45 degree direction or this 45 degree direction? And again, the photon will always say yes or no to this question. So you always do get a, a definite yes no answer to your questions. The more data then is the, uh, the correlation between the answers given at this end of the laboratory and the answers given at this end. Now, it's an experimental fact that the, the first and, and uninteresting from, our, from the present point of view observation is that the, the observed correlations are in fact what is predicted by quantum mechanics. That, however, is not, not the interesting thing from our point of view. The interesting point is that the observed correlations are inconsistent with any theory of the so-called objective local class. And that theory uh, such a class of theory is defined by the conjunction of three, uh, three postulates about the physical universe, which at first sight seem to be just plain common sense. Okay, let me start with um, locality. That's uh, any of you who have done special relativity will know about that. It is simply the postulate that if two events cannot be connected by a light signal or something slower, then they cannot cause any influence. A very basic postulate of special relativity theory being, in some sense, the whole theory of relativity is extremely well verified. Most physicists really hate to throw away that. Second postulate, well, you can, you can phrase it in various terms. I've got here objectivity, but I'd rather uh, describe it in, in rather different terms. In terms which I call, uh, this is a rather technical phrase, I'm afraid, macroscopic counterfactual definiteness. It works like this. Suppose that a given photon it happens to be switched by this switch in a counter beam. Then either counter beam will click or it will not click. That's a fact about the world. I can hear that with my uh, unaided hearing. I can write down the result. I can record it in a computer or whatever. It's a fact about the world. No one, no one uh, I think, would deny that. Now you say to yourself, wait a minute. I couldn't, for the switch curve, um, uh, equally well switch the photon into counter A. Then, what are we going to say? Now, we can make two statements here. Um, I don't think they're the same statement, but if I translate it in Japanese and see if it works, I think it still will work. Right? Statement number one is that under these unfulfilled conditions, these counterfactual conditions, um, it is a fact that either counter A would have clicked or it would not have clicked. And that and at first sight, that seems obvious, because after all, whenever you actually do switch the photon into counter A, then it does either click or not click. So, um, uh, so uh, it was a fact that either counter A would have clicked or it would have clicked. Right. Step number two, either it is a fact that counter A would have clicked, or it is a fact that counter A would not have clicked. Not quite the same statement. And if you make that second statement, you are basically affirming the principle which is sometimes called counterfactual definiteness. That is, in the language of philosophers, um, counterfactual statements have truth values. Now, let me just observe. This is a very, very commonsensical part of our understanding of the physical world. Uh, I say to you, had I got up, had I woken up five minutes earlier this morning, I would have caught the bus. None of you doubt that that's a meaningful statement. It's either true or false. Again, it's essential to the legal system. The prosecuting counsel says to the jury, had the accused not pushed his victim down the stairs, she would still be alive today. That's a, a counterfactual statement. And the jury has to decide whether that's true or false. So in everyday life, in the legal system, we very definitely assume that counterfactual statements do have truth values. That's my second possibility. Again, we you know, pretty um, unsettling had to give that up. What's important in this context is the third postulate. I've called it induction, but that's perhaps the wrong word. I should have just used the word usual error of time. The idea that the past causes the future, not vice versa. And so in particular, our setting, our switching the um, photon into, um, into one counter or the other here cannot propagate backwards in time and affect 
what goes on at the source here. So that's the application there. I say, if you, uh, if you agree to all, all three of these postulates, then uh, you produce experimental predictions which simply do not describe the experiment. Uh, yes? I have a question about objective. Okay. Now, if you have a state induction, and if you have a... You say, you say that objective is a counterfactual statement of a field class. Well, that's why... Yes, I probably use using the word objectivity wrong, but that's what I mean. I mean, I would like to make one point. If you have an induction like this, and if you have a left-hand side, if you have a new set on the left-hand side of the induction, the same thing always true. Sorry, if, I have a, uh, induction, uh, induction like yeah. um, if you have a logical induction statement like this, yes, yes. and you, if you have a vacant new z on the left hand side, so a vacant, a vacant set new z on the left hand side of the induction, it's always true. So I'm afraid you can't catch the. Oh, zero set. Yeah. Well, sure, because uh, there's so, anything. Yeah, so the uh, counterfactual argument is always true. Um, uh, I'm sorry, but I think we, we probably need to discuss that individually, because mm. I think this raises a rather um, point of the philosophers have, I think, about yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, so it, Maybe we, we have to consider more carefully about the count, how we would, we would evaluate the counterfactual argument. Well, uh, okay, fine, but uh, I think perhaps you can. Uh, uh, take it from me that, um, uh, that I believe the, the statement as I've made it is strong enough to derive this, this conclusion here. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, okay. uh, so the question is, could the outcome of the measurements propagate <coughs> backwards in time and affect the initial state within this very limited context here? Well, that's formally, it seems that probably in some sense okay, and there have been various attempts to uh, to build um, scenarios along these lines. But I think the really difficult question is can we somehow embed these islands in which um, like time is flowing backwards into a more general uh, picture of the world in which, on average, the second law of thermodynamics holds? That, I think, is the really difficult question. And it isn't, again, it's one of those questions where it's not even, uh, one of those issues where it's not even clear quantitatively what question one really ought to be asking. It's very, very simple. If it were to be the case, then I think it would have some interesting implications for free will. Again, I think I just raised my arm uh, voluntarily. Laplace comes along and says, no, you didn't, because after all, had I known the exact state of the universe ten minutes ago, I could have predicted with certainty that you would raise your arm at this point. Um, I, I, I say, no, you got it wrong. It is my raising my arm at this point which actually determined the state of the universe ten minutes ago. And uh, uh, in other words, we, um, we sort of upset the, uh, the, the usual concept about the error of causation in time. Again, as I say, uh, very difficult to think of any experiment which could be relevant to that uh, conjecture. But let me finish anyway with a, um, uh, uh, with a very general point. If, you, if we um, think about the really, really major revolutions in physics over the last 500 years. I think we will conclude that every one of the <coughs> major revolutions has involved the abandonment of some uh, idea, some uh, assumption about the physical world, which up to that time had seemed the most obvious common sense. It's obvious the sun goes around the earth until Copernicus showed us otherwise. It's obvious that the time at which an event occurs cannot depend on the state of motion of the person observing it until Einstein shows otherwise. It's obvious that um, microscopic objects which are not observed behave in exactly the same way as if they were observed until Heisenberg showed us otherwise, etc. etc. Every major revolution in physics has involved the abandonment of one or other or assumption about the physical world which up to that time seemed just the most obvious plain common sense. Try to think what uh, assumption about the physical world have not so far been challenged. I would claim that one idea which has not been seriously challenged in any of these earlier revolutions is the idea that the past causes the present and the present causes the future. 
So I think it might better be that if there's a really, really major revolution in physics sometime in the next 100 years or so, and my bet is that there probably will be, then I would bet that that revolution is in one way or another going to involve the abandonment of our current ideas about the arrow of time. Now, of course, you, uh, the, the obvious question you will now ask me is, OK, well, uh, what is this revolution going to be like and what's the theory which comes out of it going to be like? And I can really only give you the answer which I'm told that the late jazz musician Louis Armstrong gave when he was asked by a questioner where jazz was going. And his reply was, man, if I knew where jazz was going, I'd be there already. His answer was, uh, someone asked him where jazz was going, and his reply was, man, if I knew where jazz was going, I would be there already. So I would be there already. I would already be there. Yes. I would already be there. えっと、じゃあ、あの、質問ですね。時間にしましょうか。まず、はい。また時間は経つ。で、あの、あの、質問ございますか。考えてみたけど、あの、ちょっとあの、イントロダクションのところでご紹介のところで私はちょっとあの
uh, we will probably find that entropy uh, can indeed decrease um, uh, in, in time. Uh, but um, th I think the, uh, in some sense, the interesting question is what will affect the service? Yeah. And of course, partly the answer is that no system is ever completely closed. But also that we're usually interested uh, um, in times of the order of laboratory times and so forth. And under those conditions, it seems that uh, the signal of thermodynamics works, works pretty well even for a completely isolated system. Yes, Jim. from my you said that you started your undergraduate career studying philosophy. And I was wondering how this kind of philosophical grounding may have affected how you think about physics and kind of your work that you do. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes indeed. Um, well, I think it has actually profoundly affected the way I, uh, I think about physics. Um, as you know, um, uh, philosophers uh, tend to be a very... Um, uh, I think the, the English word is honor, if you might not understand that. <laughs> so, uh, they tend to be a very, um, uh, uh, very um, counter-suggestible lot of people. Um, and um, they don't, in other words, they don't um, take for granted, they deliberately refuse to take for granted what everyone else takes for granted. And so um, I think I probably had throughout my career been much more prone much more ready than most of my colleagues in physics to challenge some of the basic assumptions we make about the, the physical world. Um, one example would be that um, when I first started thinking seriously about the question around 1980, there was a um, quite, uh, I'd say, an um, overwhelming, um, overwhelmingly established view that it would forever be impossible to display the characteristic um, effects of quantum mechanical uh, superposition and so forth at the level of any object you could reasonably call macroscopic. And uh, um, I had all sorts of hand-writing arguments to do with decoherence being given in the literature at that time. Now, there were various, actually, there were various reasons why I started to really challenging this, but I think one, one reason I was ready to, uh, to try to challenge this point of view was precisely that I had been taught by my philosophical training never to take anything for granted until it was rather just been established by rather firm arguments. Um, and in this case, I did not believe the arguments were sufficiently firm. And sure enough, now, um, 30 years later, uh, in fact, many of the effects which people said were totally impossible and ridiculous have now been seen. Well, well, that's what it's so then uh, sorry uh, then uh, in connection with this uh, question um, do you intuitively think what's granted is not, not uh, correct or do you uh, it is your uh, intuition which uh, well, you know, intuition is something like uh, you, you take something granted, although without any proof. Yeah. But I in that case, if your intuition says, intuition means uh, without any proof. If you like, believe yes. that uh, you, what's taken, in, uh, accepted is uh, correct, or uh, do you intuitively counter reality what's accepted? Or do you intuitively, uh, you know, yeah, well, I, I think I would like to think <laughs> that, that I don't simply um, react negatively to an idea simply because it's established. <laughs> I'd like to think that I, I have some slightly better reason, but uh, although it's, it's established, the evidence for it, it may not may not be quite as firm as is, is often thought. Um, uh, so, I'm sorry, my question might be, uh, do you, can you intuitively judge uh, what's granted is, uh, is correct, or what, what, what uh, granted well, no. needs to be reinvestigated? Uh, uh, is no. your intuition? I mean, 
if, I, uh, if, if I really thought I could, then uh, uh, I, I, um, I think I'd be making much, much more progress in physics than I actually am. That is, I mean, I think it's uh, obviously one, in some sense, uh, almost by definition, one never knows uh, when one's intuition is correct. But, um, uh, for example, um, Einstein uh, had had certain worries about the relation of mechanics and relativity, and uh, sorry, electromagnetism. Um, I don't think he could have known ahead of time that these uh, objections were in some sense correct, he, I mean, they might have been answered by a further development of the laws of electricity. He did have a strong intuition that they, they had to be something in some sense more, more, more general and uh, more satisfying underlying it, and of course we now think he was right. Um, similarly, let me give you, incidentally, I, I'm slightly veering away from your question, but let me give you an analogy. I don't myself believe that quantum mechanics is the whole truth about the universe. Again, okay, that's an intuition, it's not, a, not something I can establish rigorously. But let me try to make an, a, a historical analogy. Um, if we go back to the year 1875, let's say, um, in those days, people believed in mechanics, by which it, what we would nowadays call, now, now it's called classical mechanics. Right? They believed in the laws of mechanics and the laws of electromagnetism as they knew them, etc. There was no experimental evidence against that. Against that picture, 1875. Some came later, but not in 1875. And yet, there was one very important thing that happened in 1875. Namely, that um, Gibbs published a paper, well, Gibbs published a paper containing what we now call the Gibbs paradox. Now, um, the history isn't that unclear, and I can't, I'm not entirely sure about this, but my impression is that Gibbs himself and his contemporaries really just looked on the paradox as a, a sort of minor accounting matter. They didn't take it terribly seriously. Had they taken it seriously, I think they would have been forced to conclude that somewhere between the level of everyday macroscopic experience, where the laws of mechanics have been verified and evolved, and the, the level of single atoms, um, mechanics, that is classical, as we now say, classical mechanics must break down at some point. They would not have been able to foresee um, at what point it would break down. They would certainly not have been able to foresee in what way it would break down. But that it must break down, I think they could have reasonably foreseen. Now, I think we're in a similar position today with respect to quantum. Uh, I believe that the conceptual problems, like the Pegasus Schrodinger's cat problem, are sufficiently severe that we can reasonably conclude that somewhere between the level of uh, the atom and our everyday experience, quantum mechanics must break down. Again, we can't tell at what point it's going to break down, even less can we tell in what way it's going to break down. <coughs> that it must break down, we can, we can tell. Mm -hmm. まあ、まあ、あの、あるいは哲学の質問でも結構です。あの、そうではない。まあ、ノーベル賞に関する質問でも結構です。どんな質問でも基本語でも結構です。はい、どうぞ。あ、please identify yourself. Oh, I'm Takeki Maranishi from Kyoto University and you've been talking about free views and so on. So I know two person one is my fiance that say they can talk with ghosts and actually they tell them about their future. Okay, I have no choice whether to believe in physics or preview. Um, but you know, this kind of experiment is quite unrepeatable. And the science, modern science, is still repeatable experiment. So what do you think? Is the modern law of physics still leave rooms to these unpredictable or psychological things? <coughs> and maybe could this be the source of free will because every person's life is irrepeatable? Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's a very interesting question indeed. Um, uh, in fact, um, I, uh, in some sense, I, I'm, I, I'm tempted to believe in ghosts. Okay, now, so I have to define what I mean by that. Okay. 
um, generally in science, not just in physics, but in science more generally, I think we tend to classify, and I think your question is, so did try to classify phenomena into two classes. That is, uh, phenomena which are uh, repeatable, giving you uh, appropriate experimental equipment by any, uh, any scientist under appropriate conditions, etc., etc. And then, um, phenomena which appear to be, or which we claim, are in some sense a function of the state of mind of a particular individual. And we think of, think of these as uh, illusions or fantasies or whatever you want to call them. That there is a subtle assumption. That assumption is that there, is, there does not exist a class of phenomena whose, um, whose realization requires both the existence of, of certain objective physical conditions and also an appropriate state of mind of the person who's doing the experiment or whatever. Uh, in the case of, of ghosts, obviously you need the right haunted house and the right date of the year, etc., etc. But you know, some people just can't see ghosts, and as you say, others, others can. And, and so I, I, don't, I don't totally dismiss the possibility that such a class of, uh, of uh, phenomena may exist. And uh, indeed, I think that's, a, in principle, a very interesting uh, direction in which um, uh, science might in the future go. Right now, I think, in some sense, uh, the difficulty seems to be that, uh, almost by definition, uh, these... Uh, experiments, as you say, are unrepeatable and uncontrollable, but there have been some uh, rather serious attempts in that direction. I don't know if you know the book, for example, by John Hastead, called The Metal Benders. He actually did take a class of parapsychological parapsych phenomena seriously, and he did do uh, a, a, a series of experiments, and he did obtain um, apparently meaningful statistics on this. And so in his case, what he found, in fact, was that certain, there were certain things which because uh, obviously did require some physical equipment and so forth, but, but even given, and basically this is the business of bending spoons, as I box and so forth. And he found, uh, at least as he reports, that, um, uh, okay, obviously you do need certain physical equipment, etc., certain physical conditions, but even given that, not everyone can do it. And he found, in fact, that all his best subjects were almost always children of about seven to nine years old. You can make what you want of that, but uh, as I say, that's what he reports. And, uh, and I would sort of tend to take at least some of it seriously. Okay, sorry to ask a second question, but I was in kind of your kind of history bio, um, biography there, you said that you, know, you killed to university in 1965. And I mean, as someone who's here now as a non-Japanese person, it's still quite, it's quite, I'm still quite a rarity, I feel. In 1965, it must have been even more of a rare event. So I was kind of wondering how it actually came about that you ended up in Kyoto. Well, by the kindness of Professor Takeo Matsubara, I guess. Um, I, uh, I, I developed a rather strong interest in Northeast Asian culture and history. And uh, since it was not, uh, I mean, uh, all sorts of reasons, but one, one factor was that it was not possible in those days to go to China because of political factors. And so um, I thought I would certainly like to sometimes immerse myself in Northeast Asian culture and history, and uh, where better to do it than in a place where there was good physics also going on, and uh, that, of course, was Kedai. Uh, and so I wrote to Professor Matsubara, he very kindly admitted me as a member of his research group, his Ken. And he wrote a very happy year. The chemistry department. So the, in the morning, you, you said the, the curiosity is very important to yes. describe the science. Yes. But nowadays, we are, the, we are under the pressure of doing some useful things. <laughs> 
or, or young student, you know, they have to publish a lot of paper. So, do, do you have any comment on that? <laughs> 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 Unless, as you said, it's a fact of life. But, uh, to get jobs, one has to publish papers. Um, but I do think, now this is, uh, this is not serious, I think, because probably there are, I imagine, there are quite a few people in the audience who are either right now at the postdoc level or will be at the year or two's time. And I would myself say, um, okay, you do, sure, you have to recognize the facts of life. You have to recognize that in order to get a, uh, apply for a further job after two or three years as a postdoc, you have to have published a certain amount of papers, etc., etc. Well, okay, so you have to. Uh, I have to take that into account and spend some of your time simply, in some sense, doing things which you have, you know or are very confident will result in published papers. However, I would also say, whatever you do, don't spend all your time doing that. Always set aside some fraction of your time, whether it's um, 15%, 30%, 50%, but set aside some fraction of your time to look at problems where you are genuinely not sure whether you'll ever get an answer. Those are the really interesting ones. I mean, the ones that you do, the problems that you do, knowing ahead of time that you will be able to get an answer, and almost by definition, they're boring. <laughs> and the people who just count papers and so forth, they may, may or may not take note of them, but they will not really, they're not likely to be important contributions in the last resort. So, you know, always set aside at least some fraction of your time. The question you just don't know that you're ever going to be able to solve, or anyone is ever going to be able to solve. You really should do that. なんか節約ライフ生活でどんどんなってきてるようですけど、今日の今日のあのこの特別講義のようなところに来ていただいてですね、あのゆっくり考えの機会を作っていただいたので、ありがとうございます。それよりも、まあここにあの足を運んでく
questions. Uh, based on the knowledge we learned right now, I think that uh, maybe we learn more. We will feel that the in the physics it become more uh, close to the philosophy. Uh, maybe we think all about it. It's not based on the experiments. It's made based on our intu intuitions. So how can we justify it? Uh, it is right or wrong. Uh, well, I don't think you really can. That is, I think that in the end, physics does have to be an experimental subject. Um, and I think that, um, you see, we have, I think this is a, a good example. We had, or most of us had, these intuitive assumptions about the world, which were in some sense really not uh, directly based on an experiment. And uh, what essentially John Bell did was to show us that uh, if we put these assumptions together, we could make certain non-trivial predictions about real experiments. <coughs> Did the experiments and they didn't, it didn't work. And so we know, we do know that uh, uh, one of these assumptions has to be wrong. Now, of course, it's possible, as I think was suggested earlier, that in some sense we should have known a priori that one of them was not justifiable. But, uh, uh, but most people certainly didn't realize that if it was true. But how can we conduct an experiment about time? Well, that's a very good question indeed. Um, as I say, this. Um, <laughs> This just shows the, the slipperiness of the, uh, the question of the error of time. Because you know, well, can, I can make these take, make, I can tell you these words about the possibility that the error of time may reverse, or the error of causality may reverse. But then you ask, how on earth am I ever going to do an experiment to to, to test this hypothesis? And at least right now, I don't think I know a way. I think perhaps if we think harder, we will find a way. After all, people. Now, people were familiar with quantum mechanics for 40 years before Bell's theorem. In some sense, it was implicit there, they just hadn't dug it out. And again, and it may be that there are things we can dig out concerning the error of time, which are there. We just have to be especially criminal. I'm from year a graduate student at my MIT Narita and you said that you learned philosophy in your university and now you research physics for a long time and I'm interested in do you have any specific problem you are really interested in for, for your research life? Well, um, for much of my research life, that is since, uh, see, I, um, I did my PhD in 1964 and I started a full-time faculty position in 1967. Since about 1979, I have been very seriously concerned with this question of the validity of quantum mechanics as you go up from the level of the atom to the level of... Uh, everyday experience. I mean, basically, the problem should in this case. Um, so I'd certainly be very interested in that for a large part of my career. And of course, that is an issue which, uh, uh, in some sense, does involve uh, considerations both from the physics and from the So you were really interested in the basic of this world? Like, yeah. I'm sorry, this is question. Thank you very much. My name is Yingi Zhang. I'm a PhD student in the province of Foxhead Fix. So, in, uh, I'm afraid please comment on your topic of the era of the time. Because uh, uh, in cosmology, there exists uh, some concept of the time, which is divided into perhaps into two different uh, definitions. One is called a global time, and then called a local time. And in cosmology, there exists uh, some space time, where the time can be just defined locally and not globally. So in this kind of space time, so we don't know how uh, how we should uh, say, for example. Connected, uh, connected the time with the concept of the entropy or something like this. So, 
I don't know whether you have any comments on this kind of thing. I would have to say, frankly, this is a very uh, technical issue which I have not, been, uh, not uh, thought about or read about particularly uh, deeply. Um, I, ma uh, I imagine um, it's sort of somewhat related to the question of wormholes, so the circular time. Uh, uh, um, I mean, I think that certainly um, some of the, if, if indeed these, um, these possibilities are often real, um, then at some stage in the future of physics, we're going to have to face up to the way in which they affect the kind of questions I've been talking about. However, I would just emphasize the fact that um, most of these, um, um, certainly most of the considerations concerning wormholes and so forth, um, uh, only arise if you make the implicit assumption that um, our current understanding of, um, of say, general relativity um, can be extrapolated over scales many orders of magnitude beyond, beyond which it's been tested. Um, just as, you see, uh, there's an interesting parallel there. The paradox of Schrodinger's cat only arises if you assume that quantum mechanics can be extrapolated from the level at which it's been tested, which at least until very recently was the level of single electrons and, and more atoms and molecules, all the way up to the level of our direct experience. If that assumption fails, then there is no showing this cat paradox. Right? Similarly, if the um, assumption about the extrapolation of general relativity fails, then at least some of these que the, the, the questions which you raise, I think, would in some sense disappear. So, so and then it's a matter of, of taste, is it? How, how, far, how seriously you take um, paradoxes which do require this kind of extrapolation by many measures of magnitude. Whether you simply say, okay, let's wait and see if the extrapolation is right or not. Which of course is going to be, in this particular case, is going to be a long time.